November 8, 1947. London. The enigma arrived in the afternoon post, sealed, smudged, and devastating. Osla Kendall stood, 26 years old, dark-haired, dimpled, and scowling, in the middle of a tiny Knightsbridge flat that looked as if it had been bombed by junkers, wearing nothing but a French lace slip and a foul mood, as she looked at the piles of silk and satin exploding over every surface. Twelve days until the wedding of the century, this morning's Tatler had gushed. Osla worked for the Tatler. She'd had to write the whole ghastly column. What are you going to wear? Osla picked up a rose satin gown whirled with crystal beading. What about you? She asked it. Do you say, I look simply smashing and I couldn't care less that he's marrying someone else? Etiquette lessons at finishing school never touched that one. Whatever the dress, everyone in the congregation would know that before the bride came along, Osla and the bridegroom were... A knock sounded. Osla flung on a robe to answer it. Her flat was tiny all she could afford on her tatler salary if she wanted to live alone and be close to the center of things. Darling, no maid, no doorman. Her mother had been appalled. Move in with me until you find a husband. You don't need a job. But after sharing bedrooms with billet mates all through the war, Osla would have lived in a boot cupboard as long as she could call it her own. Posts come, Miss Kendall. The landlady's spotty daughter greeted her at the door eyes going at once to the rose gown slung over Osla's arm. Oh, are you wearing that to the royal wedding? You look scrummy in pink. It's not enough to look scrummy, Osla thought, taking her bundle of letters. I want to outshine a princess, an actual born to the tiara princess. And the fact is, I can't. Stop that, she told herself as soon as she'd shut the door on the landlady's daughter. Do not fall in the dismals, Osla Kendall. All over Britain, women were planning what they'd wear for the most festive occasion since VE Day. Londoners would queue for hours to see the flower-decked wedding carriages roll past. And Osla had an invitation to Westminster Abbey itself. If she wasn't grateful for that, she'd be just like those ghastly Mayfair moaners, blithering on about how tiresome it was attending the social event of the century. What a bother getting the diamonds out of the bank. Oh, woe is me to be so tediously privileged. It'll be topping, Osla said through gritted teeth, coming back to her bedroom and chucking the rose dress over a lamp. Simply topping. Seeing London swanning about in banners and confetti, wedding fever whisking away November chill and post-war gloom, the fairy tale union of Princess Elizabeth Alexandra Mary and her handsome Lieutenant Philip Mountbatten formerly Prince Philip of Greece, would mark the dawn of a new age, hopefully one where ration laws were finally swatted down, and you could slather all the butter you wanted on your scones. Oslo was all in favor of ushering this new era in with a slap-up celebration. After all, she'd achieved her own fairy tale ending by any woman's standards. An honorable term of service during the war, even if she could never ever talk about it. A flat in Knightsbridge paid for by her own salary a wardrobe crammed with gowns all in the latest go, a job writing entertaining fluff for the tatler, and a fiancé who had put a sparkling emerald on her finger, don't forget him. No, Osla Kendall had no excuse to get in a blue funk. All the business with Philip had been years ago, after all. But if she could have cooked up an excuse to get out of London, found some way to be geographically elsewhere, the Sahara Desert, the wastes of the North Pole, anywhere, during the moment Philip bent his golden head and made his vows to England's future queen, Osla would have taken it in a jiff. Ruffling a hand through disordered dark curls, she flipped through the post. Invitations, bills, and one square smudged envelope. No letter inside, just a torn sheet of paper with a block of scribbled nonsense letters. The world tilted for a moment, and Osla was back. The smell of coke stoves and wet wool jumpers instead of furniture polish and tissue paper. The scratch of pencils rather than the hoot of London traffic. What does clap and trunk mean, Oz? Who's got their German dictionary? Osla didn't stop to wonder who'd sent the paper. The old pathways in her mind fired up without a hitch. The ones that said, don't ask questions, just get on with it. 
she was already running her fingers along the square of scribbled letters. Visionaire cipher, a woman's soft voice said in her memory. Here's how to crack it using a key, though it can be done without. Not by me, Osla muttered. She hadn't been one of the boffins who could crack ciphers with a pencil stub and a little sideways thinking. <laughs>